screen, we notice that the electrons are emitted from the cathode, and as they strike the fluorescent screen, we're able to see the cathode ray, this stream of electrons illuminated. We can use a magnet to show the deflection of that stream. Here we can see the electrons being deflected by the magnet. The cathode ray moves upward. If we reverse the magnet, we would predict that the beam would be deflected in the opposite direction. And we observe that the beam is deflected downward. Okay. So, we have these things called cathode ray tubes. Great. Well, a lot of scientists at this point have been playing around with cathode ray tubes for a number of years. And pretty much everybody at this point had seen something like that. They had seen a little vacuum tube with the two little probes in either end. You turn on the juice, you run electric through it, and it glows. There's this is glowing line. It's so cool. It's amazing. So what does it mean? Well, J.J. Thompson thought that this, this glowing thing, and you can only see it because of the screen behind it, thought that this thing was actually a line of particles. What made him think that? So, I want you all to undergo an experiment here. I'd like you all to take a hand and start going like this. Okay. Are you striking anything? Okay. Yes, no, maybe. Not an answer. Okay. Hand. Come on. Everybody has to play. We're not done with fun and games for today. All right, now, take a piece of paper. I'm going to take a piece of paper. So, we, we're, we're not really sure. Yes, no, maybe. We don't know if we're hitting stuff. Take a piece of paper and do the same thing. Do you observe anything happening? Helps if it's a thin piece of paper. Yes, say, Is the paper know. moving? The yes. paper that I'm holding moving? Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. You all have two <laughs> powers of observation. I like that. Why is the paper moving? Because something is hitting it. Something is hitting it. So things don't move unless they're hit by something else, right? Yes. A force has to act upon them in order to get them to accelerate, in order to move. F equals M. So what Thompson did was he took a little tiny paddle wheel. Imagine a paddle wheel on a boat or something. And he stuck it into that cathode ray tube. Right in the cathode ray. And lo and behold, when that cathode ray hit the paddle wheel, it started moving. It started rolling along. And guess what that means? If light hits this, will it move it? No. It's got to be a physical thing hitting it. There has to be some kind of particle to get it to move. Okay. Score one for JJ. There's some kind of particle there. I can tell because when it hits this other, when, when that ray hits this physical object, it moves it. <coughs> that means that particle must be made of actual, or that ray must be made of actual physical particles. Okay, good. So that's easy. Now, he takes a magnet and takes it. You, you know things about charges, right? What do opposite charges do? Opposite charges attract, like charges do what? Repel. So when, and you know that magnets have a negatively charged end and a positively charged end, electrically. When he took that cathode ray tube, and this is what you saw in the video, he took the negative end of a magnet and he stuck it up against the glass, that ray goes, Rrr. stick the magnet up there, Rrr. it bends. So not only does he now know that that ray is made of little pieces, but he says, those little pieces have a negative charge because they're deflected by the negative end of a magnet. Okay, pretty smart guy, this JJ. Um, what he says is that that cathode ray is made of little tiny negatively charged pieces. And remember, Dalton's atom is just a lump. It's a little ball of gold and a little ball of iron and a little ball of copper and a little ball of oxygen. And there's nothing to distinguish it but Thompson says, okay, in that little ball, there are little tiny chunks 
these negative particles. So we use the term, it's the plum pudding model. At that time, that would have made a lot of sense to most people. Blueberry muffin model probably makes more sense to you because the pudding is not the pudding that you think of. This is not jello pudding that you eat with a spoon. A pudding, a British pudding, is basically a soggy, baked, steamed cake. Um, so the picture up there is, is sort of a, that's a pretty good looking pudding, but it's going to look a lot better than that. Um, but it's a big ball of soggy cake. And scattered through the big ball of soggy cake are raisins. And they're distributed throughout the ball of soggy cake. So this is why the blueberry muffin makes more sense to us, because we can picture a blueberry muffin. And the blueberries are scattered all throughout the muffin. So Thompson proposes this model and says, OK, Dalton did a pretty good job. I agree with him. <coughs> but there's something below the level of this lump of oxygen, this lump of iron, this um, lump of copper. There are these little negative charges. Now there's one problem with that idea. What is it? Atoms are neutral. So, let's leave that alone for a second. We'll put that on the sidebar. So just still thinking about electrons. Because Thompson has pretty much proved the existence of these particles, these negative particles, these little electrons. Millikan comes along. How many of you understood the oil drop experiment just reading about it? It's dense. It's hard to get through. I get that. Um, kind of, sort of. So, let me ask you this. If I take a metal cookie sheet and I hook it up to a battery, what will happen to the metal cookie sheet? It'll get charged. Yeah, I'll have a charge on this metal cookie sheet. If I put another object on top of the metal cookie sheet, what will happen to that object? That object will become charged. So what Millikan did is he, he took essentially a plate, he charged it, he attached a battery to it, so he had a charge on this plate. He then sprayed a very fine mist of oil onto that plate. When those oil droplets hit the plate, guess what they did? They got a charge. So now those oil droplets can fall through a little tiny hole, and as they fall through a hole, he's playing with changing the charge in the area where they're falling. So, again, like charges do what? Repel, opposite charges attract. So he plays with reversing the charges, and he plays around with changing the magnitude of the charges until he can get those electron, those, those droplets of oil, which are now charged, to hang in midair. By doing that, he can figure out how big their charge is, and he can also figure out how much the, what the mass of the electron is. The finer details of the experiment are, are beyond me. They're beyond you. They're, it's, mm -hmm. it's dense, it's complicated. But that's a, a good sort of simplification of it. OK, so now we know the mass of the electron. We know the charge of the electron. We know that there are these little things called electrons. Now, what we find about electrons is they're really, really light. They're very, very light. So I'm going to hand you a box. Okay. I hand you a box, I'm going to say, this box is full of air. <coughs> and yet, when I hand it to you, you go, oh, God, good Lord. So what do you know to be true about air? Does air have mass? Yes. Yes, it does. Does it have a lot of <coughs> mass in the size of a shoebox? No, a shoebox full of air is pretty light. So should you become suspicious if I hand you a shoebox that I tell you is full of just air and you can barely pick it up? Yes. So there has to be something else in the shoebox, right? There has to be something else giving the shoebox that kind of mass, right? Hmm. Well, this is kind of the point we were at with atoms. So we've got these, these lumps. These lumps of matter, lumps of gold, lumps of iron, lumps of copper, lumps of oxygen. And we know that there are electrons in there. And we know that electrons have very, very, very little mass. Yet, atoms have got a lot of mass. I mean, pick up, pick up a bar of iron. Is that light? No. There has to be something other than the electron in there to give it mass. OK, so we'll leave that on the sidebar for right now. We can puzzle on that for a little while. OK, so other, other things about the atoms <coughs> that we know have to be true. So because they're neutral, 
Well, because the only thing we found so far has a negative charge, there has to be something else in there that balances the negative charge and makes the neutral overall. Okay? That's an inference based on the observations that we already have. Um, we also, coming back to the, the shoe box that I handed to you that you can hardly pick up, there has to be something else in there that counts for their mass. Because if it was just electrons in there, they wouldn't be so heavy. I'm going to pause this.